stay tuned for the second helping of the mind's eye that double shot uh because we're starting our trek to contact in the desert the biggest ufo conference in the world and in my opinion the best one somehow it is next week and because of the thou shall not be named pandemic contact in the desert this year is virtual Quite possibly, this might actually be the only virtual contact in the desert ever. So, um, you know, it's going to be a special one. And because of that, it is going to be bigger and better than ever. They've really stuffed the lineup this year. I'm doing interviews with three other speakers. You're going to hear that over the next week. The first one is tonight, Stefan A. Schwartz, one of the original remote viewers. He joins us. If you're not familiar with the concept of remote viewing, a.k.a. non-local perception, it's the ability to see distant targets just by using your mind, which is mind blowing. It's a second sight. And, you know, for those who might be rolling their eyes right now, you know, you might not want to because it is something that the CIA used in the past and may be still using today. Uh, Stefan A. Schwartz, he's going to give us a remote viewing 101 and then tease his lecture and workshop uh, at the Contact in the Desert conference. More information about both guests and how to get tickets to Contact in the Desert is on our website, themindseyemedia.com. Uh, it is your one-stop shop for sure because I got blogs uh, up there inspired by pop culture with a history twist, uh, free archives. I mean, we got 100 free episodes, if not closer, 120 free episodes by now. Uh, links to social media where I post articles that I read throughout the week that I think are so fascinating that you got to read them, and so I post them up there. Um, you could check it all out. Again, that's themindseyemedia.com. Uh, if you appreciate the content and the hard work that goes into it, um, please show a little support. Hit the Donate button at the top of the website. Uh, truly, really can't understand how much, one, I appreciate that and how much that keeps the show going. Uh, and as a way to say thank you, everyone who donates, they get at least a free episode never heard before on air. And the more you give, the more you get like free books on uh, past guests and related topics. So, again, please hit the donate button at the top. So thank you those for those who do uh, donate. All right. Now that that's done, let's get back to the good stuff. Let's welcome our second guest now, Stefan A. Schwartz, who was part of the small group that founded Modern Remote Viewing Research. Uh, if you're not familiar with the concept, a.k.a. non-local perception, that is the ability to see distant targets just by using your mind. And uh, Stephen's going to explain that a little bit better than I can because he is the recipient of the Parapsychological Association Outstanding Contribution Award. Uh, he's also the principal researcher studying the use of remote viewing in archaeology. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of his discoveries. Uh, what else? Uh, Award-winning author, scientist, futurist. Stefan, what else am I forgetting? No, I think that, that's enough. <laughs> well, I guess a, a little bit more will be revealed over the rest of the episode, I guess. But <laughs> um, but in, in all seriousness, no, it really is an honor to have you here. Uh, I mean, you've been featured in every medium. You've won a bunch of awards, worked with uh, citizens, governments alike. Uh, and because your remote viewing experience is what a large chunk of this conversation is going to be about, you've seen places and times beyond really anyone's wildest imaginations. And so we got connected through Contact in the Desert Conference. I'm going to give a talk which will be about the history of using remote viewing in archaeology, which will cover everything done before me and then all of the things that I did. The discovery of Cleopatra's Palace, Mark Anthony's Palace, the Lighthouse of Pharos, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, one of Christopher Columbus's caravels. Uh, the Brig Leander, that sort of thing, and also solving murders. So I'm going to talk about that, and then they asked me to do a workshop to teach people how to do it. So that's what I'm going to do. Let's say I attend it. Expect an experience of remote viewing, or is it really going to? Yeah. Does it take you know lots of training to to do something? No, like that? no, no. I'm going to. It, it's uh, very typical of my workshops. There'll be about 45 minutes of presentation, teaching you something. And then there'll be a half hour to 45 minutes of actually experiencing what I've just taught you. The only way to understand remote viewing is to do it. And no, most of these trainings are nonsense, as they have no scientific basis. But I am going to teach you everything science knows about this subject. What does it physically 
feel like to remote view? I mean, does does your body, brain actually feel different before, during, and afterwards? Well, Brian, if I said to you, can you remember the first time you took a girlfriend that you were in love with out to dinner? <laughs> if I ask you to that, can you imagine that? Uh, I, I probably, I probably could, yeah. Well, no, do it. Can okay. You imagine that? Okay, yeah, I'm doing it. Okay, that's exactly what remote viewing is like. But what about for something that you don't know, for example, because that I can, I can call that any moment, but that's because I've had it. I, that is my memory. What about if it's yes, not my course. memory? Well, but that's the experience. I'm just trying to give mm. you a sense uh, of mm. what it's like. Mm. I mean, that's what you asked me. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I, in the workshop, for instance, I will ask people to describe uh, a location, a picture. I would say to you, Brian, I'm going to show you a picture in an hour. And um, it's a place on Earth, physical location. Mm -hmm. Um, You are now at that location. Uh, Describe for me what you see. What what are you experiencing? What is what do you are there any colors, any smells? Make me a drawing of the most prominent shape at your at this location. It's those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. And. um, and you would record all that. You'd write it all down. And then in an hour, I would show you the picture. Hmm. Uh, sounds like a fascinating uh, e- experiment. I, I, I probably I, I think I plan on attending. So um, I can probably at least be able to attest that for that for, for some of the listeners uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, Seven, I want to focus on uh, you for a minute. Cause, and, and I know this is going to be part of the conversation at Contact in the Desert. You had such a big involvement in the origins of remote viewing do you do you mind kind of sharing about those days and and, i guess what the early days were like about 1965 i got out of the army i uh, had a series of experiences which woke me up i guess that's the way to put it and i got introduced to a weird set of coincidences i got introduced to the edgar casey material Hmm. he was uh, he remains the the most carefully documented remote viewer in history. I, actually, that's not a very good term, by the way. It, it, that just shows you where we understood what we understood in the 70s, because uh, it's nothing to do with remote and has nothing to do with viewing. Anyway, I got introduced to the Casey material and I was fascinated by it and decided I would read all the readings. So I did 14,000 and something of them. And in 1968, I decided to start experimenting. I didn't know anybody in parapsychology. I didn't know. I didn't. I, um, I in in uh, after I'd been reading the readings for a couple of years, I decided I I needed to find out what science knew about this subject. And so I went to. Uh, there were various colleges around me, and I went to the college libraries. And I read every parapsychological journal that had been published up to that date. And I decided, and I knew all the readings, and I decided that I would do these experiments. And so I created an experiment. I created a grid using a yellow line, a yellow piece of rope. And I created a grid. Initially, it was 12 squares, and then it got to 144 squares. And I would bury things in the grid in uh, in mason jars or in 35 millimeter fil- film canisters, anybody can remember that. And I would mimeograph uh, a, a copy of the outline of the grid and send it out to people all over the world. And I would ask them, I want you to locate which of these squares in the grid I have buried this thing. And if you can locate it after you've done so, please tell me what it is. Describe it for me. And I discovered people could do that. Uh, Not all the time and with varying degrees of accuracy, but they could do it. And that when I had multiple people do the same thing, I got much better results. And so that was the beginning of creating what came to be known as the Mobius Consensus Protocol, which is what I use. And I got, because I come out of a background in anthropology, among other things. And at that time, one of the big things that you saw in the uh, scientific literature and archaeology was, how do we figure out where to look? 
because most archaeological finds were made serendipitously. That is, so the question in archaeology was where to look. And I thought, well, gee, this idea of what I then called distant viewing would be, uh, would be a, a way to do that. What other discoveries did you have in uh, your psychic archaeological days? The discovery of Cleopatra's palace, Mark Anthony's palace, the lighthouse of Pharos, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, one of Christopher Columbus's caravels. In 1976, I moved out to uh, Arizona and I worked with an archaeologist to locate the talking idol of Ixchel, uh, which is on Cozumel Island. It's another one of these oracles. This was a Mayan oracle because many te- not pre-technological uh, cultures did just what the Greeks had done. That is, they would create a, a temple and they would train a group of people to do what properly ought to be called non-local perception. And, um, and they would use that to help guide, uh, to help guide the leaders of the culture in making decisions about the society. Uh, it's still going on. You can go down to the Kogi in uh, uh, the Colombian mountains uh, on the east side of Colombia, and they, the Kogi are an ancient people, and they still train l- young boys in how to do this, and they call them the mamas, did this archaeological project, and we were successful. What? Are, how else have you applied remote viewing? You talked about applying it to archaeology in what other industries or or realms are you have you applied it to well you know mostly i focused on archaeology because i could get i could get very meticulous uh, evaluation so we did that i also did a number of criminal cases Um, i wrote a book about one of them called the amish girl you can get it on amazon in which we solved the murder of a 14 year old amish girl uh, we did another one for, to locate a stolen racehorse. Uh, we did another one about a postal bomber who was sending bombs in the mail. Uh, what I do believe is that consciousness is causal and fundamental and that there is a greater consciousness than just humans and that, in fact, all living beings have some measure of consciousness and that the what we call reality or Einstein called the great optical delusion um, is a manifestation of consciousness. You got this ability. Of course, you're going to go into the future. What did you see when you remote viewed the future? Well, right now I'm doing the analysis for a remote viewing experiment. I started in 1978 as I was leaving government uh, because I was concerned we were going to have a nuclear war, I began uh, getting people to remote view the year 2050. Now, why 2050? And the answer is because if you go too far out ahead, you don't understand what they're talking about. I mean, imagine in, say, 1880, somebody told you that people carried around something as big as a pack of cards that would allow them to talk to anybody in the <laughs> world. I mean, how would you even interpret that? So if you get too far out ahead, uh, you you don't understand what they're saying. So I started in 78 to look at 2050. And I did that from 78 to 91. I had 4,000 people take part in that experiment. And then um, as uh, they were so accurate as to what they said consensually, that is, not every person got everything right or everything. But when you look at the consensus, it's the same thing that you do in intelligence work or in investigative journalism. You know, you get multiple people to tell you what they know and they don't get everything right. But when you see something come up again and again, then you pay attention to that. Or if you see something that is low a priori, that is, something you would never expect just seems so off the wall. In this case, for instance, as I said, I was interested in because I thought there was going to be a nuclear war. And in fact, were it not for one Soviet colonel who wouldn't push the button, we would have had a nuclear war. But in any case, uh, you know, I would say I, I would ask him questions like, 
Well, if there's not a nuclear war, um, what is the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States like? And they said, well, it does. The Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. I mean, that's low a priori, right? I mean, who in 1978, 80, 81 would have ever imagined the Soviet Union disappearing? It was this a huge monolith, the great bipolar, all that sort of stuff. And yet, of course, it happened. And when I asked them about health care, they said to me, well, there are going to be a lot of p- pandemics. And I said, pandemics? I mean, the only thing I could think of was Spanish flu and 1918 and they said oh yeah there's gonna be a bunch of them and the first one will be a blood disease that crosses over from primates to humans in Africa and it will go on to kill millions of people and I went to a friend of mine who was then the deputy director of National Institutes of Health and said to him do you know anything about a blood disease that uh, could kill millions of people that crossed over from primates to humans in Africa and his answer was, Stefan, I don't know what you're smoking, but whatever it is, quit. So that's how low a priori this stuff was. But in any case, now in retrospect, I can see that all of the things that they consensually describe turn out to be true. They, for instance, climate change. I didn't know about climate change till 1991. And yet they kept talking to me about how the cities were underwater and didn't make any sense to me at all. And nobody I knew in the science community did it make any sense to them either. So now I'm doing a 2060 experiment and I want to see what the difference is between 2050 and 2060. And I'm also interested in answering the question which nobody's ever been able to answer. And that is when someone does a precognitive future, that's what that word means, um, remote viewing, Are they describing a fixed future or the highest probability future at the moment you're asking them the question? And nobody knows the answer to that, but I'm hoping that between the 2050 and the 2060 debt, I may be able to shed some light on that. Stefan, in your opinion, where do you think the ability to remote view stems from? Uh, the big argument that was going on in parapsychology was, is this stuff electromagnetic? And when I had been in government, I um, had a friend who was the head of the CIA, and he began to send to me um, translations of secret documents that were done by a Soviet epidemiologist named Leonid Vasiliev. And he had been tasked by the by the Central Committee of the Politburo the same question, is this electromagnetic? And so he was putting people down into mine shafts or down into caves and putting them into Faraday cages, which is a, a kind of a metal structure that blocks electromagnetic radiation. And he would ask them to do uh, non-local tasks. And he discovered they were just they did it just as well as they did when they were on the surface. And so the argument was, well, if it was electromagnetic, the only part of the electromagnetic spectrum that he wasn't able to shield. And he said the only way to do this would be to uh, put somebody in a submarine at depth. And he went to Admiral Gorshkov, who was the head of the Soviet Blue Water Navy. And for whatever reason, he wouldn't do it. Anyway, I read this paper, but after I finished the project in Arizona, I got offered a fellowship in Los Angeles, and I went out to L.A., and I stayed with a friend of mine, Don Keach, who was had been the deputy director of Navy Labs, and he had um, retired with another friend, Don Walsh, and they had taken over the Institute of Marine and Coastal Studies at the University of Southern California. And he said, you know that crazy submarine experiment you wanted to do? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, we got a submarine that's coming down to do its sea trials at our Catalina Island facility, and we'll pay for three days to let you do that experiment. And so I did. It came to be called Project Deep Quest. And it, first of all, it was, could individuals locate a previously unknown wreck on the sea floor? So I put people down uh, and asked them to describe where people were located on the surface. 
Oh, by the way, I should say to you that um, you can go to YouTube or go to my personal website, stephanaschwartz.com, and you can actually, I made films out of these uh, projects, and so you can actually watch the films and watch people do it. Deep Quest is the submarine experiment, that's what it was called, and you can actually watch it happen. As I got Leonard Nimoy, Dr. Spock, to do the narration, and they were successfully able to do that. Not only the depth, but the bit rate of information that they were able to provide uh, when they were submerged made it clear that this was not electromagnetic. Non-local perception is not a function of electromagnetic activity. So, so what is it a function of then? Is it the body, the brain? What, what is it, Stefan? It, well, I mean, we don't know what consciousness is and we don't know what information is. And those are the two great mystery questions nobody knows the answer to. What I can tell you is a little bit about how it works. It is, there is an aspect of consciousness that is not physiologically based. That is, uh, the physiological idea of consciousness, the materialist, physicalist idea, is dead brain, dead meat, no brain, dead brain, no consciousness. But this turns out not to be true. I mean, uh, anybody who's had a near-death experience, and there are about uh, 14 million people who've had that experience, will tell you uh, they had these strange, extraordinary experiences, and their doctors will tell you they weren't alive at the time that it was happening. Their brains were not functioning. So uh, there is clearly an aspect of consciousness that is not physical. And this is, uh, and, and if you can develop the ability to attain and sustain intention focused awareness, let the normal sensorial stimulus that dominates most of your thinking, it's hot, it's cold, it's dark, it's light, you know, I can smell something, whatever. That retreats into the background and what in religion is called the still small voice, this aspect of consciousness that is not physiologically based, emerges and you can get information. You can get any kind of information you want. And so the idea of remote viewing, which we created in the, myself, Hal Putoff, Russ Targ, Ed May, Jim Spottiswood, P Pat Price, Ingo Swan, a few people created remote viewing. Um, what, we did, what we designed was a protocol or a series of protocols, really, uh, that people could learn how to do and that would allow them to provide information that could be objectively verified, but that they could not possibly know as a result of being separated by time or space from the information. Um, really interesting. We really appreciate your, you know, your contributions to, to, to remote viewing in a science perspective. So we really appreciate it, Seven. Happy to do it. Whether you're listening from the comfort of your coffin in the cold dead of the night, or just reviewing us remotely from your mind in some distant far off place one we thank you and two don't stray too far because we got two shows next week as mentioned uh, as we make our way to contact in the desert first up we got Xiao Ma she is a Chinese ufologist based in Australia Xiao's going to give us a global perspective on UFOs and maybe some lost civilizations that the western hemisphere has never heard of Finally, we got the last show before the summer break. Dr. Michael Masters, he's going to cap it off and tell us about time travel and human evolution and answer if aliens are humans from the future. Until then, be well and let well be. I'm DJ BJ. Turn off, signing off from the mind's eye. <laughs>